Hudson Valley Biodiesel Co-op. Um, we, I'm going to go through a little bit of the history of how the co-op got formed. We got formed five years ago. Um, there's a lot of content on the screen, and I'm just going to talk over it. Um, if you want to read, you're welcome to read. Uh, but we got started in, in 2004, and we got started by a group of people who were uh, local act, uh, activists involved in environmental issues. And the idea of biodiesel had come up, and people were interested in it, we didn't know what it was. Uh, we started to form, uh, have dinner together once a month, talk about it, understand what it was, and so on. So for about three or four months, there's a group of different people coming to different venues in order to uh, talk about and understand what biodiesel was. So we ended up finding a space in Cottage Hill, which is in, uh, near Woodstock in New York. It's called the Sustainable uh, Living Resource Center, which is a public space, it's a green building. Uh, it seemed like the perfect venue to be talking about this type of opportunity. And as we got into the late winter, and we actually realized that we wanted to do something as a group, we wanted to actually build a, a biodiesel processor and make biodiesel, the uh, landlord, if you will, of the space said, well, I have a woodshed, you're welcome to build one here. So that's what we started to do. So uh, by the winter we did it, and then we evolved into our first processor. So by March we had a workshop, <clears throat> and the first workshop was to uh, build a processor. So this is the woodshed. Um, you sort of see the building off to the right. So it's also first, approved, of course, right? Yes, this is all uh, legitimate stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is about as grassroots as you're going to get for a biodiesel car. I can see the so, grass. <laughs> <laughs> We've been accused of that in Charles you know, as well. So basically we emptied out all the wood and in this woodshed we went and to the local town dump and we found a 40 gallon electric hot water heater. One of the members of the co-op was a local fireman and so he brought the fire truck there and we pressurized it to make sure it didn't leak. He put like a couple hundred pounds in it and it didn't blow up. Um, so we ended up using that as our processor. Uh, the building as you can see over here uh, has solar panels on the roof so it's a green building it has green hot water, it also has uh, PVC for electricity on the top. So we ended up you know, starting out in the springtime, clearing out the space, and this is, can't really see it well enough, but this is our processor, so this is a 40 gallon processor that we had, we had some wash tanks that we built a, a platform for, and then come uh, April we started brewing up in the woods. So we've gone through a process of uh, coming together as a group, trying to decide what our goals were, what was our mission, why were we doing this, um, where were we going with this? We had all these questions that a lot of you probably have as far as forming co-ops. And at the time, what our mission was was to educate ourselves and educate the community um, and set up a viable biodiesel processor so that we could learn how to do it safely and uh, make good quality fuel. We didn't really know how to do that. We weren't sure how to test the fuel. I mean, there's all these you know, questions out there, but that was sort of our goal at that point in time. And what happened was, as we moved on, we got a couple of people Oh, uh, and then we ended up having the luxury of, uh, this is a solar trailer. We do solar panels on the roof. And we were affiliated with the Clearwater, which is a sloop that uh, sails up and down the Hudson River. PC goes involved with and, um, So we had the benefit of 52 weeks out of the year having the trailer next to our co-op, and so therefore we use this for power. And this is a battery-based battery system, an off-grid system, so we had enough power from the solar generator, the solar trailer on a, a good day to heat the fuel, run the pumps, do everything we need to do. So our co-op is off grid. <clears throat> so we're not grid time. Gary, do you have any idea what sort of expense would be involved with a solar system with that much juice? Uh, to buy a system like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, it wouldn't be reasonable to do. <laughs> 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 And th this particular trailer, and we've just run into the issue this year, we have a folk festival on the Hudson River every year, and we take the trailer to the, the festival, the Clearwater Festival, and we power the eco-tent or the green tent with all the activists that are there. So we tow this there every year. If you go inside, we have uh, some benches on the side, we have literature and other kind of educational stuff. When we towed it there, some of the batteries broke. So we went to actually turn on the breaker, we ended up creating sulfuric acid smoke inside, Things caught fire, and uh, part of the batteries died. So um, this is currently out of commission, and now we're talking about five thousand dollars worth of batteries to replace them, and we can't justify that. So we're deciding what to do. We're looking for out outside money in order to replace it. The Clearwater organization is. We just have to be the beneficiary of the fact that something out there. Um, so we went on, and um, 
and we had all kinds of issues with the co-op. Uh, some of the issues that I want to talk about in, in this, this uh, forum that we're going to have, um, you know, what is a co-op? What's the structure? Is it legal? How do you pay taxes? I mean, a lot of the issues coming up here. How do you test for quality? How do you compensate the co-op for the fuel that you're taking? I mean, these are all issues you have to deal with depending on the type of uh, co-op you become. So legally, we decided that um, you know, we're from the Woodstock generation, and we're up in the woods and so on, and we're sort of out of sight of everybody else, even though we're very public. Uh, we decided not to incorporate and to see how far we could push sort of the envelope. So we're not a legal entity. We have no corporate officers. We don't have a bank account. Um, we don't own property. Um, we're on somebody else's property. Um, we don't have an electric bill we pay. We're not tied to the grid. Do you have anything in writing in forms of bylaws? Uh, no. <laughs> we are about as free form as you can get out. Um, and we did it intentionally. And we're, issue, we're five years down the road, we've come up with a lot of the issues about what to do. Uh, the only thing we did do is we had one person who's a treasurer because somebody has to keep the money, but he keeps them in his pillow. So we don't have a bank account. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't have a lot of cash anyway, so we're not really investing it. Um, but basically, as you take fuel, uh, you pay him back. We have a little mailbox that's mounted inside of our shed. I'll show you in a second. And uh, when you take fuel, you put your money in there, and this guy comes by once a week, every couple weeks, and takes the money, and you know whatever bills we have, he puts the money out and so on. Uh, so our mission was really to escalate the advancement of biodiesel technology in Hudson Valley by providing a focal group, a focal point in their interactive forum for people to come through. So we're very much open. Every month we have a forum. People come uh, to brew with us. People come to talk to us. We go to local events. Every month we're at a county fair or some organic farm or someplace like that. And we have a booth and we just talk about biodiesel, uh, what it is, what it's not, what our experience is. We try to get members to come and so on. Um, as was said before, we do have a lifetime membership, it's $50. We realized that if people came to the co-op and said they wanted to be members, but didn't make any kind of commitment to it, then they probably wouldn't continue to participate. So we figured the threshold was about 50 bucks. If you pay 50 bucks to join, then you're entitled to the fuel. If you don't pay 50 bucks, if you don't join as a member, you're not entitled to the fuel. You're welcome to come and help us brew. You're welcome to bring your oil. You're welcome to do whatever, but you can't take fuel away. And we came up with, and this was a while ago, a couple of years ago, $2 a gallon. So we figured it was going to cost us about 65 to 70 cents a gallon to make. Again, we have no overhead whatsoever. We have methanol cost, we have potassium hydroxide, and we have the physical uh, cost of the processor of buying a new pump, a new clear water pump for 30 bucks, or you know, changes in plumbing or something like that. <clears throat> all the plastic barrels we have, we got for free from a local car wash. All the totes we have to store things in, we got for free from another friend. Um, so basically, our only out of pocket was the initial cost of buying the materials to build the initial processor. And then as we've gone through year to year, we've changed the processor. We've gone from a 40 gallon to an 85 gallon. We've you know, used the same pipe. And we, had, we changed the, the tubing, but the other than that, it's about the same. <clears throat> One of the things I'm interested in exploring is the issue of jobs. How do you justify being part of a, of a co op, of a membership, and how, how do you become entitled to the fuel? So as Lyle was saying, in their particular case, and these are the things I'd like to hear from other people as well, um, we've decided that a, a member gets what we call karma points. So <laughs> yeah, karma points um, are not specific to a particular task. So even though we do have brewmasters in the same case that Lyle was talking about, we have a couple of people who are the more experienced brewers. We try to get everybody involved in the brewing process. We want everybody to participate and feel comfortable at all different levels. One of our goals as an educational advocacy group is to help people understand how to do this and help them to do it for themselves. So although we try to get people to join as members, we also act as a forum for people to come and learn and then to go off and set up their own process or their own uh, either co-op or do it in their garage. So just back to the job. So we value collecting oil, uh, buying supplies, brewing, washing, moving things from here to there, getting rid of the glycerin, and so on. These are all equally weighted. I'm not sure that's a good thing, but that's the way we've evolved to do it. Uh, there's no formal measure of how much a member has to do. Um, in Lyle's case is, if you bring 13 gallons, you're entitled to take back 13 gallons. We don't have it because <clears throat> we're literally brewing in the woods. We're not in the middle of a downtown area. We're not near restaurants. If you want to come to the co-op, you have to decide to come there. It's not like on your way home. It's like from the middle of the woods. So 
uh, we encourage people to, on the way to the co-op, pick up oil. So we've come up with restaurants and other institutions that are nearby that are, uh, we have an, uh, an informal handshake agreement with the manager of the restaurant, owner of the property, to give us the oil. We have different ways of collecting it, as you all do, either by putting barrels out or by picking up in the cubies or in pails. But we basically have about 10 different sources of oil that we collect from on a regular basis. Then we have a schedule. And so we know this week, if you're coming by, you stop there and you pick it up. Next week, somebody else stops by and picks it up. Or we have parties on a Friday afternoon or a Saturday afternoon, rather. We'll go to Vassar College. We'll go to the retreat, which is their cafeteria. We'll all have food. And then we'll go around back and we'll take 50 or 100 gallons of their oil. So we do it, you know, we'll go in a van, we'll take some barrels, we have a pump, and we do it as a group effort. So we do it sort of in the community spirit again, rather than doing it individually. Um, this is all historical stuff that's maybe not, not that important, but we got to a point where the woodshed um, didn't work anymore. So after our first year, uh, came come November, it's a little cold up in the woods, and the Catskills would be brewing biodiesel, so we stopped. And we took the processor, and we moved it, and there was a, a video made about us doing it. It's on uh, YouTube and stuff. And so we moved the processor to somebody's chicken co-op, coop. And uh, we insulated the coop, and we ended up having problems because we moved to somebody's residence, and that particular person didn't want people on his property when he wasn't there. He had his own time frame, and so the whole co-op just sort of fell apart. Um, a few gallons of bodies were made, two batches in the wintertime, and that was the end of it. We started again the next spring, we built another processor in the woodshed again, went through the same seat issues and realized at the end of the second year we weren't, we had another winter facing us, what do we do? So we decided to build a shed. So we raised some money, and one of the guys here, uh, Scott Jeff, is a carpenter by trade, and uh, he designed the shed that we built, and he spec'd out the materials as a contractor, he could get the materials cheap, we also went out asked for donations, so we got some of the materials given to us from different groups, and we built this shed, which is a little hard to see, but basically it's um, 11 by 14, which is the, the legal size you could build as a non-permanent structure without getting a permit and so on, so that's not permitted either. So again, we're not legal, we're legal, but we're not re recognized that way. Um, and this is inside the shed. Is that, is that kind of your goal, was to kind of keep it uh, we just recognize it. We recognize it because of where we are. Um, I live an hour and a half away from this. I mean, I live 70 miles away. Um, <clears throat> I have my own processor, my own house. I make my own fuel, heat my house, run my car. So I don't get fuel out of the co op. I just, one of the organizers and advocates here. Um, but these people, like this guy Harry, who's in the picture, and Miyashi, who's over on the right, um, he lives about eight miles away, he lives three miles away. So a lot of the members do live close enough that they can come on a regular basis to participate. But the problem we've had is that, again, nobody lives nearby. So to make it more formal, we'd have to have real legitimate people who really wanted to do this on a regular basis. And so we have a couple of people who've been with us for four years, five years, but for the most part, everybody comes through every year for a year or two, and then they go off and do their own thing. And we've got five or six successful uh, co-ops have been sprung out of what we've done in different areas of the Hudson Valley. So now, if you're driving through the Hudson Valley and you need to get biodiesel, um, you can stop on the east side of the river, the west side of the river, whatever, at friends and members, co-ops, and we trade fuel and we trade resources. So the idea has been to keep it as informal as, poss as possible. And just, uh, we have, again, you can't see it because of the slide, this is an 85 gallon hot water heater um, that we, we use a, our basic processor. And you can't really see, but inside, this is a 330 gallon tote. So within the square that's the, the shed, um, on the right hand side is a tote for all the uh, uh, WBO. It goes into the processor, it comes out into the wash tanks, which are over here. And then we have a finished tank, which is over here in the front. So we have sort of a flow from the right to the left. Um, yeah, so in 85 gallons, we make 60 gallons at a time, so we have. Uh, two batches uh, in process at any point in time. So we have two wash barrels with one batch, two wash barrels with a second batch. We've been making a batch, two batches a week. So we're back 120 gallons. Sometimes we make three batches a week. Um, the issue of how people are entitled to the fuel, again, just going back to that, um, our karma points, I think I have a slide. No, well, this is just a long shot. You can't really see it. We have uh, soap making as well. So we have soap making workshops. So this happened to be, you can't see the snow on the ground, but this is 
in the uh, early spring and we had a table set up and we had lots of glycerin and we were all making soap, um, which we, some, one of the people sell, but most of us don't. Uh, but back to the karma points, the issue is, well, let me just go through this quick. Uh, collecting oil, as I said, we have Colony Institute of America, Vassar College, SUNY New Paltz, and then other restaurants. So we have standard sources, same idea, we've already titrated them, we know that the quality is good. Our, our limit is three. If it titrates higher than three, we won't take it. Wow. So when we've been lucky enough to be able to turn away enough oil that we can get the volume that we need in three or, or, or less. Is it just because it's too hard to process? Um, one is if you're out in the woods and it's cold, it's, it's really a bitch to try to get the oil to flow. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of issues with, with weather because of where we are. So we've just decided that if it's that we have the luxury at this point in time of getting things that are three or less. And so we've turned away anything more than that. We've also had the experience, uh, it's not up here, but there's a, a conference center in, in Terrytown, New York, and they're trying to go green. A lot of companies are trying to greenwash themselves, or uh, some of them are legitimately trying to produce, promote themselves as ecologically, environmentally responsible. So they call us up and they say they have all this grease from the restaurant. Do we want it? We said, sure. So we went there, and we always go with the titration kit. So we go with the titration kit, we tell them that three is the limit, and we get all the cooks to gather around, everybody's in their white mm -hmm. smocks and whatever, and we're all sort of looking at what we do, and we say that it's three, and so we go and we start putting in our titrant, and it starts to turn magenta, and then it goes back, and so on. Everybody's like, ooh, it's like magic. And if we get over three, then we ask the question, or they ask us the question, what's wrong? And we say, well, you're not really treating your customers correctly, because if the oil is going out at higher than three, that means you're not changing it properly. You're really not managing your oil well. And maybe you should go out and eat the food and really see if the food is any good. So, I mean, right? I mean, that's, that's what's happening. So we went to this, this particular place. And in particular, they were really trying to send the right message. So the master chef went out and uh, he ordered some fried food. <laughs> and he sat down and ate it. And, you know, when you go to McDonald's, you put ketchup on it. I mean, you don't really taste whatever it is. But when you go to a fancy restaurant that fries delicately food, and this was an upscale place, uh, you don't want to taste the rancidity of the oil or the burntness or whatever. So he tasted the oil and the oil, he actually tasted the oil in the food, and he realized that his customers hadn't complained, but maybe this was an issue. So he decided he would change the oil every day. So he promised us he'd change the oil every day. I said, look, you know, not my problem. Thank you for doing that, but please don't, you know, add the additional expense to your business to do that. Um, I'm not trying to ask you to do that, but if you want to do that, that's great for me. So he changed it, now they change it all every day, the titrates is about one, sometimes 0.5. <laughs> and there's no crunchies in it, because they filter it for us. So we've gone nice. to all these different places. We went to Culinary in America, which is one of the premier cooking schools around. And we, we do classes there where we go in when they bring freshmen in for the first year cooking students, and we explain what biodiesel is. We're trying to take in a sense, the next generation of cooks around the country and explain what biodiesel is and explain why we want the oil. So when you guys go to those restaurants and you ask for the biodiesel, they'll, they'll know what you're asking about and they'll know how to give it to you in the right way. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so we've been lucky enough. That we're in a large enough area that there's a lot of <coughs> enough restaurants around and for the volume that we're doing, we're doing quite well. We also have an agreement. There's a Dutchess County Fair, which is like the state fair. And we go there every year, and they give us between 500 and 1,000 gallons in a week. So we bring a trailer with a tote. We bring a trailer. We put two totes on the back, 330 gallon totes. And we go there every other day, and we bring the totes back to the co-op, offload them, pump them off, and take the trailer back. So we get a tremendous amount in, in one shot. A couple you of years ago, from there that helped you get the, uh, you know. Um, I spoke to. I, I called the guys up that, that run it and spoke to them about it and told them we we're interested. Shared with them what we we're doing. We happened to have one of the co-ops spun off from ours in the town nearby, so we took them there. We took them some biodiesel. We put it in one of the trucks. I mean, this is farmers coming. I mean, it's the right environment to be talking about this kind of sustainability, renewable, etc. So we also go there as part of the. Uh, we're part of the Cornell Cooperative Extension, which has a booth there every year talking about different types of alternative fuel and crops and so on. So we bring biodiesel there and we participate in their booth to help talk to people as well. So I mean, again, we're, we're, we're not in it to make money, we're not a business. Uh, we barely break even. Um, we uh, are able to compensate for whatever our, our, our costs are and keep things running. Um, but we do it because we want to do it, you know, basically. Um, we've also, this is at uh, Culinary Institute, you can't really see, but we've come up with a, a six, six gallon olive barrel that we built the stand for. 
So this door opens up so you can take the barrel out if you have to. This lid opens up so you can pour the oil in. Um, I don't know if you've run into a, a, a shortening shuttle. You may see the shortening shuttle at a restaurant. Yeah. So I mean, they, they make devices where <clears throat> this is a, a long uh, stainless steel tube, and they lay it underneath the fryer, and they open it up, and it goes in, and then they lift it up like a hand truck, and they wheel it out. And then we have on this particular one, we built it just for it. There's a metal bar that's right here. So they bring this thing up to it, they put the scoop of the shortening shuttle over our bar, lift up the bottom, and it goes right into our barrel. So we've done stuff to accommodate the, the types of ways in which they bring the, the, the waste oil out to the uh, containers as well. And just off to the left here, in case you can't see it in here, is a regular dumpster from the local renderer. And so our rules are, and it says on the top, that if you have any question about the oil you put in here, put it over here instead. <laughs> So we've lost a lot of good oil, just but we don't want to take, I mean, it's a schlep for us to go and do it. And the same issues all of you face, and what do you do with the creamy stuff at the bottom and the crunchy stuff and so on? We have all those same issues. We have the luxury of every time we come back to here, we come back with five or six cubies and put them in over, over this other dumpster. And so we're you know, helping out Barling Industries, which is our renderer, by giving him stuff that we didn't generate at this particular location. You think so? Um, yeah, how does the renderer feel about that? <laughs> um, we've talked to some of the renderers, and we've gone there. Uh, we have one case at uh, actually at Bassard College where we put our barrels right next to the barrels of the renderer. In this case, the renderer has barrels inside the kitchen. There's like a utility shed, and so the kitchen puts it into the barrel, and they come and they wheel the barrels off. They stole our barrels. And so we went back to them and said, you know, our barrels are missing. What happened? And they said, well, we don't know. And uh, there happened to be video, luckily, which showed them taking our barrels and throwing them out in the dumpster, which is pretty obvious. Wow. Um, so we, with this particular guy, we had a, a lot nice long conversation. Um, and we have signs on ours. I mean, you, you saw the barrel. It had placards on it. We have legal, um, you know, just like they do, you know, anything, five, $500 reward for anyone tampering with this barrel. And the <laughs> contents of the barrel belongs to the whatever. Um, so we talked to them about it. You know, we called them out on it. We got some local press about it. And uh, it hasn't become an issue since then. Um, Could you go back to that slide real quick? Yeah. You said you arranged a, some sort of lip for them to make this, it easier. This, this lid lifts up, uh -huh. and there's a metal bar across the top here. Yeah. So the shortening shuttle is like this. It's like got wheels on the bottom. It's this metal column. It's got a, a two uh, uh, elbow at the top. Uh -huh. So they can bring it up, and they can put it on a bar, and they lift up the yeah. back, and it pours right into the top. I mean, it worked perfectly. I mean, they were very happy with it. I mean, we tried to accommodate our partners, you know, in helping us out. So we tried to help them out. The as barrel well. itself is always an open top. It's yeah, it's an olive barrel. It has a very large open top. Okay. And the top of the shortening shuttle, the way we've lined it up, we actually put some uh, wood on the side so they can line it up just right so they don't splash down the side. And you don't have any trouble water, rain, water getting in there. No, because because of the way that the, the lid is, is set up. The actual lid is tucked in the back there, so if we have to, we can open this door, take the barrel out on it, and then uh, put a new barrel in. Or if we have to, we pump out all the good stuff, open this up, walk over here, dump the crap in the bottom. For a you usually pump the pump is... Yeah, we have the, uh, the Northern Tools, the 10, 12, whatever gallon per minute pumps. The ones that pump the hoses, whatever. So we can just back right up to it, pump it out. What's been the average quantity of product that you see your restaurant producing? It all varies, but um, most of the ones we pick up from are very small. So we pick up between 10 and 15 gallons a week. Um, <clears throat> some of them change the oil three times a week, which would be the five gallons and one fire. It all depends. We've, we've selectively chosen, like I say, we're, we're trying to get three below. So we've, like, we've chosen the restaurants we pick from, and we pick the ones up that have enough volume and, and enough storage where they're willing to store the QBs in the back for two weeks or three weeks so that we can come by and pick them up at our convenience. The other ones, we try not to put barrels if we can help it, but we have uh, four or five restaurants with barrels. Indian restaurants, we tend to put barrels in the back, Chinese and Japanese restaurants. Um, we don't have any high volume ones. And we don't pick up from you know, McDonald's and Burger King and all that kind of stuff, Kentucky Fried Chicken. These are all pretty much smaller mom and pop kind of restaurants. Uh, some of them are chains where there's two or three family owned Greek restaurants, that kind of stuff. Um, and just. Um, just some of the issues that we had. This is our partner points that we came up with. Um, one of our questions still is, how do you recognize work? I mean, what is it that you do to be part of a co-op? Um, 
if you <coughs> bring the oil, is that enough? If you um, buy the supplies, is that enough? Uh, how do we get the supplies? We buy um, our KOH, we buy our methanol from a legitimate commercial biodiesel refiner that's about 75, 80 miles away from where this co-op is. So we have to take our barrels there, they refill the barrels for us, and then we pick up 50, 50 pound bags of KOH. So someone's got to go there and make the trip. It's across state lines. Um, we try not to, we would like to bring back more than two barrels of methanol at a time. It's illegal. So there's a lot of legal issues as well. Um, we do it in a box truck, uh, which again is illegal. Uh, so we'll take our barrels, which we put waste oil only on, in case we have to open the trunk, the, uh, the door on the box truck. So if you look inside, it looks like it's veggie oil, not methanol. Uh, so we've disguised our barrels. Uh, but we have to go across one bridge that crosses over the Hudson River. And, uh, and uh, sometimes DOT stops the trucks. Uh, so we have a lot of you know, unique sort of situations that we come up with. But again, is the person going to get the methanol, which is a three and a half hour, four hour schlep, how do you compensate for that time? And do you pay for the fuel? I mean, the fuel obviously is biodiesel, but then what percentage of the fuel is that guy entitled to in order to go and make that run? So we decided that in this particular case, whoever goes to get it gets as much biodiesel as they want. There's no tolls involved, so it's really just fuel cost and time, and they get credit for the time they put in in making that particular trip. People that pick up oil do it on their way to the processor. So other than these parties we have on Saturdays where we all go collectively, or the county fair where we have to use a couple of people, individuals come and collect either by pumping or by bringing the cubies in. Uh, brewing. Uh, we have a training process where we try to bring people in. We start them out at the very beginning. We teach them titration. We teach them to make small batches. Uh, we take small batches and we line up 10 jars and we'll start with 3 grams per liter, 4 grams, 5 grams, up to 12, whatever. We'll take some really bad oil. We'll make bad batches. We'll show them what it looks like, how to recognize a bad batch, how to recognize or how f uh, flexible, if you will, the process really is. You can screw up and still make good oil. I mean, there are some tolerances, obviously, but you know, there are some exceptions. So we try to bring everybody up to the level of feeling comfortable brewing. We try to make sure that there's always two people there at any point in time. Yeah. So Jerry, do you actually now equate hours worked to biodiesel finished fuel or something? Yes. Come up with? Yeah. We, we have, in our particular case, uh, we've just decided that, and I have a sample here. Uh, <coughs> if you brewed 400 gallons in a month, and therefore there's 60 hours that people put in. And we use the Yahoo calendar to record stuff as well. And if Jeff put in 18 hours, but he brewed for 10, he washed for six, he collected for two, and so on. He, different people did different things. This guy, Miyashi, does our website. It has nothing to do with brewing, but it's time spent in helping to keep this, this thing going. So we end up with 60 hours. The question is, is all this equivalent? In our case, it is. And so out of the 60, Scotty, for example, put in 10 hours, so how much can you get? Uh, it's 10 hours, it's 10 gallons an hour is what it comes out to as far as what we brewed based on the time put in. So basically, and also again, we're in the middle of nowhere. So to get to the co-op, you have to drive 20 miles, 30 miles. You have to spend fuel to get there. It doesn't make any sense to not be able to fill your tank up enough to compensate for your time being there and walk away with more than that. Um, and just, uh, we also, we have people who, because we're in the Northeast, who use it for home heating oil. So we have co-op members who have, don't have diesel vehicles, but take the fuel back in order to heat their homes, yeah. Okay, but just to, to keep my perspective, this is 10 gallons, for example, your example, that, that member's entitled to 10 gallons and $2 a gallon. Right. And, and then one of the questions we come up with is $2 in today's market, realistic. Back then, it cost us 65 cents, $2 was a lot. But now, if they're normally paying five dollars, should the co-op raise the price to two fifty or three? And we don't know, right? Um, top, you say sixty hours are recorded. Right. But below it says four hundred gallons divided by forty hours. Is that okay. the? Okay. Oh, that was a typo. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Make easy maths. Yeah, I, I think I I started out with forty and then I made it sixty because I threw some more people in there. But I mean, the, the, the concept is the same. Is you take the total amount that was brewed by the total number of hours that were put in by each individual person, and that's what they're entitled to take away. And then sort of the same idea that was asked about Lyle is that if you have, if you put in, if you're, if out of the 400 gallons you're entitled to say 100 gallons, but you don't use 100 gallons, but you love the, to be there in the woods and making biodiesel and so on, can you give your share to somebody else? And the answer is, in our case, yes. 
And so you can either donate it to somebody. And what we have is, maybe you guys do too, there's a lot of people with biodiesel buses that are traveling around the country doing educational stuff. So we have a lot of these groups that come by and want to stop and get fuel. Well, they didn't work. They didn't do any of this stuff. So where does the fuel come from? So we allow the members to donate, if you will, some of their share to these people, but they still pay the $2. Yeah, that's, that, that's quite impressive, those outcomes there. Uh, Take it at another level. Do you have any checks or balances, or are each individual responsible for checking and ensuring the quality of all that? We have, yeah, um, we have, we do the, we do a wash test. So every time before you take the biodiesel out of the wash tank, you have to do a wash test. Just water and biodiesel, we'll shake it up, and so on. And we do a 327 test. So we do have some quality control. Um, we always try to have at least two people there at any point in time, and it's always one experienced person, at least one experienced person, with one naive person or, or novice. Uh, we've had many cases where, again, we're trying to do education, educational advocacy. People have come by because they think they know what to do. We have also have, I don't have pictures of it, but we have a checklist. This is how you make biodiesel, and this is the step that you've done in that particular batch. So anybody coming in can see what the last step was and see what the next step is. So anybody coming in knows what to do. We also post it on our website so that people can look on the website. We also use the, the Yahoo list to say, I'm going to be there tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock. Anybody wants to come, we're going to watch, or we're going to do whatever the next step is going to be. Um, the whole media, how green is that? When you burn it like that, is it polluting the atmosphere at all? Or is it? Uh, it's, it's, it's less polluting than, than the regular number two oil, um, similar to the, it, it's different types of emissions from, from when you burn it in a combustion engine. So there's a whole different spectrum as far as what you're looking for, but it's a much greener thing nonetheless. It's greener than the oh. not regular number two oil. Because in our case, the, the, sulfur, the sulfur content of on-road diesel fuel is 15 ppm, 15 parts per million, the ultra-low sulfur diesel. In our area, in probably yours too, you can still buy 500 ppm for low sulfur diesel. It's still available for all the purposes of private fleets. In the Northeast, it still has high sulfur diesel, which is about 1,500 to 2,000 ppm. It's still being used for home heating oil. So if you can put some biodiesel in there, even if it's five gallons, you know, you're going a long way to help reduce some of the emissions. Uh, we have most of our members are using about 30 to 35 percent uh, mix of two, number two oil and biodiesel. Nobody's doing 100 percent for home heating oil purposes. How do you cost compare the home heating oil versus the biodiesel at two bucks a gallon? I don't um, know. In, in, in my area right now, um, although I haven't looked in the last few days because the market's gone down, but uh, last week it was about four dollars and thirty cents for heating oil, and diesel fuel with all taxes was five fifty. Okay, so and two bucks for the right. So it's two bucks for the co-op versus the four. It used to be around two dollars a gallon for home heating oil, and nobody was really interested. Right. Now we have a lot more people interested. Okay, you said thirty-five percent or so was the most that anyone uses biodiesel. In, for in our particular group, yeah. I mean, okay. this is a whole other issue as to what, right. how much you can use and how much you can blend, and what you have to do. Right. Basically, um, I don't know if you want to jump in, but basically, uh, you have to change the nozzle to be a little bit smaller to a smaller orifice in order to atomize okay. the fuel in order to burn it properly, and you have to increase the pump pressure in order to get a little bit more pressure through, again, in order to atomize it, because biodiesel right. is slightly higher vis viscosity than regular heating oil. Um, if you go higher than that, then you might have some issues. And then there's an issue of an uh, optical sensor in your home heating oil system that will look at the color of the flame, and if it's not burning properly, it will shut it down. So you, there's things you have to look at when you go to a higher level. But we found that 30%. We have local home heating oil dealers selling bioheat, which is 20%, in our area, there's a tax credit in New York State for 20 cents a gallon if you buy bio heat, so there's an incentive to do that. So people commercially, retail basis, are selling it as B20, uh, so we go to B30, B35. Are you making any, met uh, taking any methods at this point to reduce the uh, congealing effect of the diesel when it gets cold outside? Yes. Um, we are doing what we're calling uh, cold processing. Uh, basically, what we've done is we've taken the fuel, especially in this environment where we're outdoors anyways, um, but we take the fuel and we put it outside when it's cold. So basically we're going to let it freeze. <clears throat> when it freezes, what happens is when, it, when you watch biodiesel start to gel, you're going to see it turn cloudy, and then you're going to start seeing a low, layer of sediment across the bottom as the waxes start falling out. So what we've done is we've done that on purpose. We didn't warm up the biodiesel, bringing it back indoors. You end up with that same, maybe a quarter to a fifth across the bottom of thick uh, waxes that are there. We decant the top half 
And in fact, we've been able to lower the gel point by about 15 degrees. So I, I run 100% biodiesel on my own car. I did it all winter long. It was down to 15 degrees. One night, I've had no problem. I have a block heater and stuff in case I get in trouble, but I haven't done that. <coughs> so we do that. We also use an additive. Uh, we've been using Winter D, but there's lots of additives out there. Different people have had different um, success with, and the, the additive actually, although it says that it's really at, it's really affecting the diesel portion of the, the blend, it really does work with biodiesel as well, the stuff that we're using, and that drops it down another 5 to 10 degrees. So you've seen success down to about 15 degrees right now? You, I mean, you have to be willing to take the risk. Um, you know, if it's your work vehicle, you don't want to do it. If you want to work, you know, if you're commuting to your personal car and you don't mind breaking down and going through all of that, you know, depends on how glorious you want to be. We don't, you know, we don't encourage people to do that because we don't want people breaking down. We don't want people having issues. So we tell them, in our case too, in the Northeast, you get a winterized diesel. So whenever you get diesel fuel at the pump, in the wintertime, it's always blended with kerosene. So you get even a 70-30 blend, a 60-40 blend. The dealers will blend the fuel to whatever the temperature they think is going to be over the next week or two. So if you have diesel fuel, it's winterized diesel, and then you're putting the biodiesel into it, it's already a winterized blend. You won't have too many problems with that. I just have one comment. You, you can put, you keep a little sample pint glass in your car, right? And, and, and look at that every morning when you go, go out there, and that's exactly what's going on in your tank. So that if you need to hit a, hit a, a trojan spot before you gel, you know. right. well, what I did is I took and I showed it last year. I have a picture I can bring it up of um, uh, jars starting with B50, B60, B70, B80, B90, B100, right. with an additive, without an additive, and then a thermometer outside. So every morning I wake up on a that back. Back porch, and I take a picture, and I look to see what the optimal ratio would have been for that particular temperature range. And then after a while, you know if your biodiesel is relatively consistent, based on your feedstock and processing, you know the, about where you're going to be safe and where you're going to have issues. So, how are you blending at those temperatures? Um, most of the members are still running uh, a blend. Uh, very few of the members are doing B100. I was told below 45 degrees is not actually going to blend properly. Um, I, can, I work, uh, my day job is working for a large petroleum distributor that distributes biodiesel through automated rack systems, blah, blah, blah. So I can tell you from that perspective, um, there are issues with blending, um, whether it's splash blended or whether it's racial blended, how you get the fuel, how it gets to market. If you splash blend, meaning you take biodiesel and diesel and you put it in a tank and you drive someplace, you shake it up, it, it's not miscible at colder temperatures and you do have separation, there are some issues. And you will have gelling and gelling. Typically, will settle out just like if you use unwashed biodiesel, uh, you can end up with glycerin every morning in the bottom of your tank, and that's the first thing you're going to suck in your engine. Um, so, if you don't blend it properly, you are going to have issues, uh, depending again what ratio and what you're blending with. I mean, all of this you have to experience. You know, you have to go through and you have to make the mistakes and you have to learn from it and figure out what what you're willing, what risk you're willing to take. Maybe from the insurance side, what your risk and risk reward ratio is as far as you know how you you're dealing with. It. You mentioned that during the winter you let it freeze and decant off the, the good stuff off right. the top. You save the rest for we'll a save the rest, and when it warms up, we yeah. just blend it in with whatever we're making at that point in time. Uh, and just to jump into two things, one is wash water issues and, and glycerin issues that we have. Um, we're up in the woods. We get our water from a well. Um, we're reasonably high away from the water table, so what we've done is we've set up a sort of a spray pattern, so whenever we drain our wash water, we have a like leach field, like a septic system kind of thing. So we just spray it out over a long, large period, large acreage as far as not to have any concentration. We've had no real problems with that. Um, there's methanol, obviously, that's, that's involved in that, and the methanol eventually just evaporates off. So we do feel responsible for that. We haven't gotten to the point where we're recovering our methanol from the wash water. Do you literally spray it, or? We have, or a, in, in our barrels, we have a, a valve, and it goes out, and we have this hose that you would get for um, a septic system or sort of for a garden for diffuse watering, then we go out with that. Um, the, the latter ones we do it at full force, the earlier ones we do it at sort of a half force and let it sort of trickle out. You mean like a soaker hose? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with, with a, a three way on it, so it's coming out and you have three of those, so you have you know, quite a big field. Um, but we're not doing it on the lawn, we're doing it like into the woods and you know, no trees have died and we've, we've seen no. Infestations of bugs or anything, I don't know, or lack, lack thereof, I guess. And the glycerin is a big issue for us because um, we end up getting, as you can imagine, you know, uh, 80, 80 gallons of glycerin a month from the 400 gallons that we make. And so, what do we do with that? So, we've 
partnered with a couple of CSAs, which are community supported agriculture, that happen to be in our valley. And so we go to the, the farms and they put it in their compost pile in some cases. In one case, we have a, a greenhouse that's on one of these CSAs and we got them to buy from Ag Solutions. I don't know if anyone knows about this, but Ag Solutions has a waste oil burner that will burn, burn glycerin. They've done a lot of experimenting with us and with our commercial biodiesel processor. And so what they're doing is, normally glycerin is a byproduct. This, in this case, it's a co-product. And so since you're entitled to 50 cents a gallon tax credit, when you blend biodiesel from waste oil with diesel fuel, they're claiming that they get 50 cents a gallon from glycerin, which they're blending with heating oil to make heating fuel. So they actually file for tax credits for that way. So we're donating our glycerin with methanol to the CSA, and they're burning it in the greenhouse heater in order to heat the greenhouses. <coughs> but we've also come up with a, uh, a method for doing the, the following film evaporator that Maud talked about last year. Okay. Hopefully, there's two, two sessions tomorrow about methanol recovery. But anyway, we're doing methanol recovery as well. <coughs> two more questions, and yeah. then we've got to finish up. Is there any way that you want to reuse your wash water to treat it or paint it and reuse it over and over again? Um, we, we just, uh, the, the last wash water is always the first wash water of the next batch, but other than that, we don't, no, we don't recycle it. Yeah, I, maybe somebody else can speak to that, I, I don't know. Another question? Can we, oops. we have a website out there that we're putting up lots of information on, which we'd love to see, and uh, just our, our website is hbb100.org, and uh, we meet the third Tuesday of every month at a local restaurant where we get the oil from and they have dancing at 8. So we eat from 